So hi, I'm Joyce Graff. This is The Powerful Patient, and we're here today with Sue Buckley from Knoxville, Tennessee. We're going to talk more with Sue. Hi, Sue. Hey, Joyce. Hi. And we have with us also Megan Conley. Hi. Hi, Megan. Hi. Good afternoon. Great. And Megan is from Tampa, Florida. So, um, Sue, I wanted to talk with you today about your experience with working with visually impaired teens. And um, I know that you have founded an organization called Club Vibes that's very active in working with teenagers. Tell us a little bit about how you got involved in that and your own story about how you got to that point. Okay, well, I guess I'll start with Club Vibes and kind of go backwards a little bit, but Club Vibes stands for Visually Impaired Blind Enhanced Services. So my husband and I are both totally blind now, but he had low vision and I had vision when I was younger, then lost my vision later in life, but we both have teaching backgrounds. He's post-secondary, taught at the University of Tennessee, and I was in the K through 12, um, got my degree at Illinois State Education School, um, and during that time, I was really looking to become a teacher, so that's what my, my interest was, and went into, into that field, but then gradually realized after I got out that teaching was a hard thing to find a job immediately after, so I got into the YMCA, the Young Men's Christian Association, and started working my way up really administratively there, working with teenagers, youth, youth development, leadership programs, uh, camps, day camps. So basically all ages from Montessori preschool that we had in the YMCA, all the way up to really senior citizens, but uh, I guess we can't call those kids, although sometimes I think we all are in second childhood. Um, yes. But um, I really focused on the youth development program. So I became a national trainer with the YMCA on camp programming and teen development and leadership skills. Uh, that's seemed so far back. It's hard to believe, actually. So uh, about 16 years ago, John and I got married. I was living in, at that time, in Memphis, Tennessee. And we moved to Knoxville after marriage. And I was, I left the YMCA at that time after 25 years career and decided that, you know, maybe I'd just take it easy for a little bit. Well, that didn't last very long before I realized I wanted to take my interest in working with the visually impaired because now by that time had already totally lost all my vision. So I thought, here's a skill of all these resources and knowledge that I maybe could enhance the kids and parents that are mainstreamed in the school district and help them kind of navigate the field of blindness and visual impairment um, during their educational system. So that's why Club Vibes was started, was also to, I guess, I love tandem bicycling. I love sports and recreation. So I wanted to make sure that kids that were blind and visually impaired would get out and participate actively in sports and activities. Um, to get a job, I guess, and to participate in the wider community, I realized how much adaptive technology is needed and needed to be taught during transition time for blind and visually impaired. So my husband and I both said, let's start our own not-for-profit. Thus, Club Vibe started. And we've been working in the Knoxville, greater Knoxville area, really, because it's East Tennessee. We have parents and students from uh, four or five different counties outside of Knox County also that we work with. So it's really as large as we can reach out. We've had students who have been living here in the summer in this area with, with relatives, and we meet with them in the summertime, and we stay in close contact with them even after they go on and go to college or go back to their home state area. So, and of course with Facebook and social media, there's some real, uh, I guess, great abilities to stay in touch outside of your local community. That's wonderful. So you, you have quite an extensive community of current and graduated students that you've worked with. Yes. Um, and again, the YMCA development training programs, 
uh, from board development administratively and working with the youth and the training that I received while there has really greatly benefited, I feel, starting this not-for-profit. And so I bring that administrative and teaching background in addition to being blind and visually impaired myself and living the life really so that we can be role models, my husband and I, or mentors, I hope, good mentors to youth as they transition into their adulthood. So as I've watched from the sidelines with Club Vibes for the last couple of years, what I've noticed is that you really help these people blossom and um, develop a, a self-assurance that they didn't come to you with. Yes, correct. I think that self-isolation or quote being somewhat different when they're young in school from their peers, sometimes that's very difficult until you get into a group like-minded and you, you feel comfortable asking questions. So we bring that in Club Vibes uh, locally where young people come together. And I really, I agree with you. I've seen their self-esteem, their leadership qualities really grow because they get an opportunity that they may not get with their peers in the mainstream school. So even r riding a tandem bicycle, talk a little bit about that. Cause I know you've recruited <laughs> volunteers to be the pilots, you call them and the the, the kids sit, sit in the back and, and are the power behind the pilot. Well, I'm glad you said they sit in the back because some of them have threatened to sit in the front, but <laughs> it is a two-seated bicycle. That's, that's beyond leadership right there. And right. that would be beyond trust of our pilots getting on the back seat. So the pilots are recruited. We have about 50 right now volunteers who ride bicycles. We own a number of tandem bikes, the club does. Um, but a lot of people have their own tandem bikes and just love tandem bicycling with their wives or husbands. It's typically men that are the pilots because they're stronger and taller and their wives are willing to give up the back seat to some blind and visually impaired young people. And it is just wonderful because really we have from the youngest who can reach the pedals, which is about nine or 10 riding bikes with us, all the way up to the youngest at heart in mid seventies. Uh, that has ridden bikes with us on tandem. So, you know, it's just wonderful to see the 75 year old being a great role model in his job or her job with the young people that are in middle school asking questions on how do I become um, an attorney or how do, you know, what things do I need to do? What did you do? So what, what equipment do you use in your office? So, those are the kind of things that I think the parents tell us by coming into our home and seeing how we live in quote our clubhouse they see how we just go on with life whether we have a visual impairment or not so our parents like to tell us they that we give them hope from day one when they come into our home um, to see how things are labeled how do we match up clothing how do we label our microwave, how do we do dishes, how do we do laundry, how do we know which color outfit we have on. Um, you know, they get to see all those tools in action and know what's out there that they didn't even know existed before. Right, right, and you have a beautiful and beautifully decorated home, and <laughs> so it, it really, I'm sure, it is a sign of hope for these young people that they can have a fruitful and happy and productive life. And we've even done some trips, um, which really develop their sense of, I guess I would say, uh, abilities, but also their guts, you know, to go to, we took a yes. trip to St. Louis a few years ago and in Union Station Hotel, which was, is huge. I mean, it is huge. Sighted people were getting lost, um, <laughs> some of our volunteers. So after a couple of days, you know, teaching them to navigate from, their room to the main lobby to meet us in a certain gathering place for the exhibit hall of this particular conference we were going to to meet at the swimming pool and just gradually bit by bit giving them that security that they can do it and that they did you know overcoming some some fears that their parents have um and in a safe way to do that with our volunteers 
Ryan, and tell us a little bit about some of these little bike rides that you do, because they're not small bike rides. <laughs> yeah, little, little bike ride. Well, I just did one the other day, and I haven't, because of COVID, I hadn't been back on the tandem myself. I've personal trained instead with a personal trainer at home, but because of COVID, I hadn't been trusting, you know, to get on with somebody else. You're not six feet distant on a tandem bike. So you're within eight, on, the whole bike's about eight foot long. So you're about within two feet of each other. And the, the bike ride the other day, they said, we're going to go on a short bike ride. Now, some of these people are riding single bikes and they've been biking all, all spring and summer. So they're like, well, we know you haven't been on the bike. So you don't have those bike sores from the little saddle, as I say. Um, so they said short bike ride. Well, it ended up being 24 miles. That was, that was short for them. Um, and so they said the next one we'll do is 40. I'm like, we're jumping from 24 to 40. So most of our bike rides that we do with Club Vibes starting out are 10 miles. Uh -huh. And most of the the young people are like, I can't, there's no way I can ride 10 miles. I mean, that's the first thing they say. And I'm like, you watch, you'll do it. So we give them that you can. Now, typically it's loops. We have an area where we're doing loops. Um, so we go up, kind of go around this real pretty fountain area. And it's, it's as level as it can be for Knoxville, Tennessee. <laughs> so I have to preface that by saying it's not flat and it is not Iowa. It is definitely <laughs> Knoxville, Tennessee. So we do have some hills. So it challenges the young people to give us a little power, use their muscles in their legs, which a lot of them are like, I've never done that before. They've never really been, haven't been expected to do something that, you know, feel a little pain in the muscle. And that's, that's a good thing. You know, that's a good thing. You're stretching the muscle. You're just not sitting all the time. Um, your muscle will get stronger because you're doing that. So their cardiovascular, their physical health, their social interaction with each other, but also the volunteers. Because we have volunteer who um, worked out at Oak Ridge Lab, and he was tutoring one of our young ladies in physics who's getting her degree in the biosciences. And so when she was in college, she was like, she asked me about physics. And I just looked at her like, well, we'll get a volunteer for that because that's not my cup of tea right there. So right. Our, our volunteer pilots go beyond just being on the bicycle with the young people. The other thing that I remember some of the kids saying to me that was the feeling of the wind in their hair and the yeah. feeling of freedom and movement that was new to so many of them. Especially the speed in which you go. Because when you're traveling visually impaired, either using a guide dog or a cane, you're navigating a, you know, a heck of a lot slower than you would on a bicycle. Right. So this is some of them, a lot of them have never ridden a single bike by themselves. That they couldn't balance and do that. Right. So that freedom to fly. And that is, by the way, our motto of Club Vibes. We have a a dragonfly as our little mascot. And you will see that on some of our, our items that we have because we believe on a tandem with two people climbing a, a hill in Knoxville, Tennessee, or in the Smoky Mountains, the mountains, we drag it up the hill and we fly down the other side. So it's a <laughs> dragonfly and it's the, and we, we hope our program gives them the skills, the success and the confidence to, to do things and freedom to fly in their future. Fabulous. So thank you. And and then COVID happened. Oh uh, yeah. So so mm -hmm. uh, you and I had had a conversation about your observations of what the kids knew, the transitions that they had to make. Like all kids, they w went to online classes instead of classroom classes, mm -hmm. and the the challenges that they had that were even greater than most students. Tell me about Yeah, that. well, in March, when they were not going back after spring break, and it was pretty sudden, at least in our county, that this was gonna happen, there was a lot of, even the teachers were really, you know, everybody was kind of caught off guard. Right. So we didn't know what we didn't know. And right. what we have found out real quickly was that computer skills, at least for within our county, were 
blacks for students that were or should have been equal to their peers in using computers or some Zoom platform or some other uh, device to be able to log in, um, whether it be Zoom or what is it, Microsoft Teams, Google, Hangout. Well, it's not Hangout anymore, but all those were foreign to the kids mm -hmm. because they hadn't been using that before. So for a lot of kids who do not have visual impairment, they pick up the computer, you know, they open it up and they, they log right in and they can click on, you know, just click on the pictures or whatever apps they need and they can explore with their vision mm -hmm. and use the mouse to click on where they need to go. And, you know, within a few five, 10 minutes, they're there, you know, they, right. they can kind of figure it out. Well, when you're blind and visually impaired, you're using a screen reader. So you're using your hearing and unfortunately, sometimes the, the software packages may not even be that accessible. Um, I will say that Zoom, kudos to Zoom, they are accessible. Um, and they've done a really good job of trying to um, make every time you see a little graphic or something on there, like the microphone, it will read it by my screen reader telling me it's a microphone. Or raise your hand. I mean, it doesn't have just the hand. It, it says raise hand. Um, you know, so it's, it's accessible, but we're not able to look at the screen and just quickly see what thing we need to pick. So we have to learn to navigate with shortcut keys. There's a lot bigger learning curve. You right. have to learn, like, do you tab through these? Do you arrow? How do you? So what we found is there was a huge, a huge learning curve on the adaptive technology. And if a student who, say, was in 10th grade, going into 10th grade this coming year, is expected to perform equal with peers in their mainstream classes, uh, whatever class they're expected to take, how are they going to do that if they don't know how to use the platform that's going to be used by the school system at distance learning? Um, so when they started doing some of the distance learning back in end of our May, March, early April, they went back to doing that. We, we realized the school teachers even, the, the teachers of visually impaired, had not taught the students any of that. So they were caught off guard. And so Club Vibe stepped in and said, let's get some of our older um, members to study for themselves. These are college age and learn the platform because they'll be using it themselves and right. then teach, teach the younger ones. So we had Zoom classes on Zoom, <laughs> Zoom on Zoom. <laughs> Um, and, you know, we, we blind doing this with blind. So we're the ones teaching, you know, this is the thing you look for, you know, as you tab across with your screen reader. And um, Joyce, you asked me earlier, you know, am I using iOS? Am I using a Mac computer? Am I, you know, as we started this podcast recording. Right. And because it does matter. So what we yeah. found is depending on which technology you're using matters what the shortcut keys are so it gets more complicated more than what the the viewer needs to know but it there's a curve there's a big learning curve and there was a real big gap I mean it was like jumping across the lake and we needed to give them some paddles and some canoes to kind of get there so right. we started doing that and we reached out to the school system to find out this coming year what social media or distance learning platform will they be using so that we can start working the summer on teaching the youth to use that so that they're at least hopefully equal with their peers in how to open up the program, how to navigate the program, how to interact with the teacher, um, how to communicate or chat, asking questions with the teachers behind the scenes right. and using earpieces or whatever they need to do so it doesn't interrupt the other students by their screen reader talking at the same time the teacher's talking. Good points. Yeah, and uh, there is a technique to using Zoom, even visually, there will be a chat and how do you chat to the teacher, how do you chat to everybody, and then there's sometimes a Q&A that's separate from the chat that you have to 
put your questions to the teacher in the Q&A, so that mm -hmm. there's all these kinds of things. And as you say, with our vision, we can look and immediately know where things are on the screen. But when you don't have that vision to help you get oriented to it, it's a matter of drawing a picture left to right, <laughs> top to bottom, to mm -hmm. try to figure out where you are supposed to poke or <laughs> what key combination you're supposed to use as an alternative mm -hmm. and and there's a lot of skill that you need to build around just that just using that yes now i do know too there's a lot of when you're using a mac or a pc there is a lot of shortcut keys that you can learn but again it's a lot of memorization what i've learned with these students is they're a lot younger than me, so they can remember all this stuff. But I, you know, I'm a little slower on the uptake nowadays, it seems like. <laughs> and, you know, I've learned one screen reader. So when you go to switch and do something different, it's like, wait a minute, I'm constantly pressing the wrong keys because I'm using the other screen reader kind of in my head. So as I'm using this software package, you know, the, the holding down the alt key and pressing Y is raising your hand. Okay. Right. And yeah. so there's shortcut key combinations, but there's a lot of memorization to it. Yeah. Um, or you, you flick as I'm going to call it flick, 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 flick until you find it, which when you're doing that, you're not really hearing the teacher. So it's a really mm -hmm. bad daydreaming distraction. <laughs> um, so we really want to teach them the shortcut keys because otherwise they're really going to miss a lot of the lecture possibly in high school, what the teacher thinks they're paying attention to. So we thought, Sue and I had a long conversation about this some time ago, and, and we were really thinking that we wanted to do some powerful patient interviews in order to share this with a broader audience, because I think what you've picked up on here is extremely valuable. And I'm sure that your kids are not the only ones who have struggled with this all year. So, um, we're going to do a series of interviews here that talk about uh, what people can do at home, what parents can do, what the school systems might be able to do, and how we can supplement the learning. And as you say, not waste the summer, uh, developing these skills and becoming more facile with the programs so that when you do go into the classroom, you can focus on what the teacher is teaching and rather, rather than just on the mechanics. Well, yes and also how to do things that other students you know we talk about the adaptive technology but like orientation and mobility learning to walk around how do you do that from a zoom platform or from a, a distance learning when you're not actually as a teacher physically out there doing it how do you teach spatial awareness how do you teach some of the skills to learn to navigate safely for a from a blind perspective if you're not able to have face-to-face -face contact as a teacher with the student. So I know I have, we will have some teachers that we can talk to um, on future, future podcasts that could maybe address some of those uh, techniques they're using. Great. So we want to invite everybody to send their questions in. Please send questions to info at powerfulpatient.org. And we will do our best to incorporate your questions into future programming. So Megan, are there questions that came up for you? I know that you're new to this subject and, and that's a good thing. So There are no dumb but, questions. No dumb right. questions. <laughs> Glad for your perspective. Thank, thank you, Joyce. Uh, Sue, I was wondering what is, what is the appropriate age for students to get involved with Club Vibes? Well, for the tandem biking, they're a little older because they have to be able to reach the pedals. So that's a good question, Megan. I mentioned about nine or 10 on the tandem bike. It just depends on, you know, safety on the bicycle and stuff. But as far as with Club Vibes, we've had students as young at, well, we actually had a five-year-old that started with us, um, but with his parents coming also, talking about things that they can do at their house to their home to make it more user-friendly so that he would do things be expected around the house to do things that his other five-year-old peers, classmates, would also be doing at home, like maybe setting the table or um, 
putting things in the refrigerator, knowing what goes in the refrigerator, what doesn't need to go in the refrigerator, what goes in the freezer. Um, how do you open cans of things? How do you pour when you can't see? And also teach him the cleanup messes if he or she makes them. So mom or dad will let them learn because sometimes helicopter parents are out there. Um, and that's, you know, it's understandable, but you, uh, we look at it this way. What you're teaching today, you've got to make sure that when the person is 30 years old, it's productive. So if you're opening, always opening a can of peanut butter and making the sandwich for the young person, when they're 30, are you going to be doing that? Probably not. You know, you may be wanting them to make your sandwich when, you know, by the time that your child is 30. So we tell the parents that, you know, look at it from the perspective, is this something that my child needs to do? No. So as young as five, school age, on up, but we have had parents also call us that had um, early intervention programming. So, you know, they babies, but they're just really talking to us. They're not really coming to the clubhouse and participating. So with our larger group, the youngest we have coming right now is a 12 year old in our social groups that we meet together. Before COVID, face-to-face, -face, large group of about 30 gathering, um, learning communication skills, group interaction, how to host meetings, how to set up agendas, giving the older ones the opportunity to actually set up the agenda and participate in a leadership component of that agenda. So, and then of course the young ones getting them to let demo maybe a new app they found on their phone, even if it's a gaming app, doesn't matter, but it gives them a chance to be in charge and you know, so we are family all the way from those very young 12-year-olds uh, all the way up to we have some college students now who are kind of mentors and still participating, but really in more of a leadership role. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. Uh, just one last question. You know, Club Vibes is accessible to students in the Tennessee um, area. What about, are there other organizations uh, that you work with in other states that would be a good resource for parents? Um, well, that's interesting you say that because what we have done is we've reached out on Facebook to the American Council of the Blind and the National Federation of the Blind. They're two big national membership organizations, primarily for adults, okay? American Council of the Blind is acb.org and National Federation of the Blind is nfb.org. And both of them have what you call like subgroups or affiliates. And both of them have groups for parents and both of them have groups for college students, but not usually younger than that. So with Facebook, you know, there are some groups that have been set up so they can communicate. But again, it's usually at least high school or older um, that are communicating through the Facebook. So I would I would say that, you know, they could reach out to us and we could get them in touch with, through our website, um, a local organization that we may know of in their area. There is no other Club Vibes um, that has the actual name Club Vibes, but there are similar organizations with a little bit different focus. They may be, say, only tandem biking, not doing some of the adaptive technology or resource sharing. Or they may be just doing some of the resource sharing and not a sports component of the program. So, you know, there is no exact replica of our program. Great, thank you. I think you also mentioned that these kids are have not always been doing the same things that their peers would be doing, like Instagram mm -hmm. or other things like that. Uh, what what have you learned about their need to be in on some of those other activities? Yeah, well, a lot of times when they come up through the school system, if they've been low vision or total, as we say, no vision, low vision or no vision, when they were younger, starting out in school, a lot of times some of that, the technology hasn't been given to them at the same equal time as their peers. So like my granddaughter has started with keyboarding when she was, you know, they put her hands on a keyboard, I think, in kindergarten, 
second grade, you know, expected to kind of start learning home rows and things like that. Where the blind and visually impaired, it seems like they've waited. They might have had a Braille keyboard, but they didn't get the computer keyboard in their hand, shamefully, I think, until junior high or beyond, which mm -hmm. is beyond me. Because as you all know, social media, Twitter, you mentioned Instagram, Facebook, all these things that are out there that would be wonderful not to socially isolate somebody who's blind and visually impaired, who can't drive anyway. So when we're 16 and we can't drive, this is a way for us to stay in contact with what's going on in the world. Our friends, the, even the news um, through your, whether it be your iOS device or your computer. So it's super, I think it's even more important than someone who's sighted child. It's even more important that they know these skills because it's a bigger, it gives them more understanding of what's out there beyond their home, beyond their community, beyond their hands that they can touch. Right. So and I think, mind. I think that the other thing people may not be aware of is the number of visual helps, visual aids that are available in a smartphone. That, oh. that it'll read the price tag. It'll read the, uh, you know, QR you can codes. get the details on the, yeah, you read the QR code and it tells you all the details about the nutritional value of this cereal or all that stuff. It, it's an amazing device and it'll tell you which denomination the, the bills are or, you know, mm -hmm. you, you tell some of the other things you use your smartphone for. Well, Joyce, it was interesting because when, when I first lost my sight, there wasn't mainstream devices like the iPhone, okay, or smart devices. So, you know, you would pay $1,200 to get a device that does one thing, like read, read a barcode, so that it would scan the item and tell me it was tomato paste and not a can of peaches, all right, in my kitchen for $1,200. I'm like, and the database was like, you know, eight meg or something. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was like, you know, you can't get that many groceries, Sue, because you only have to eight megs of memory here. <laughs> um, so, you know, you had to eat the same things, not really, but, you know, but it was a way for me to, and I thought that was like amazing that I could have this in my home uh, if I could afford it and it would do that. Well, now a handheld device, like an iPhone, which is a mainstream device, it's not a different type of iPhone than, than you have Joyce. It's exactly go into the Apple store, get exactly what everybody else is buying. All you have to know is it's in the settings and you set it up that way. And once you turn that on, um, and I will forewarn the sighted people listening to this podcast, do not do this unless you're trained as a blind person to do the gestures. Because if you turn it on, it doesn't, uh, doesn't navigate by touch the way you right. think it will. Because we're not using our sight, we're using our ears. So we flick through the screen and we listen to what it says. And then when it tells us where we want to be, then we double tap the screen. So it will do everything from, I could take pictures. It will tell me if um, my camera is, has got someone's face centered in the middle of it. It will actually tell me that with the screen reader. It will let me, you mentioned taking pictures of money. It will let me color test things. So I know if I'm wearing, you know, blue, or black pants. Um, it will tell me, uh, which my daughter, my granddaughter loves. It'll tell me what color my skin is. That's wild. Cause <laughs> she's always like, you're getting really tan. What color does it say now? You know, uh, she's fascinated by the technology, but there's so, you know, this is probably old commercial. There's an app for that. There's an app for that. There <laughs> truly are apps that are specifically made for blind and visually impaired, but recording notes, note taking in class for college students. Um, there are um, book, book reading apps that are specific to blind people. So you can, you know, the old yellow markers that used to be the highlighters back in my day in college, you can drop a note and highlight part of the text and then search based on what you have highlighted. So for college students, it makes it easier to navigate textbooks. Um, you can get your textbooks right on your iPhone. You, you know, it's just amazing how much the world has been open for higher education academics, but also gaming, 
for fun stuff for the young kids. Um, I mentioned the orientation and mobility, cane travel. There are games that help teach spatial awareness to kids who've never seen. So they, when they navigate maybe a new unfamiliar area, they learn how to get around and become familiar so they don't get scared or nervous in an area. Um, there's GPS for blind vision impaired that tells you points of interest that are around you, which is really interesting to use if you're on a tandem bicycle when you're going fast. <laughs> I will say that's really interesting because they'll be like coffee shop boom you're gone I'm like oh, we missed that coffee shop. you know like now I turn this on so they don't pass any restrooms when I need them I'm just gonna say because the guys will tell you oh yeah we only could two more miles I'm like that was a restroom right back there <laughs> that's really so, great I should probably make a little disclaimer here that you hear us talking a lot about an iPhone I'm personally an Android user but um, oh. I do know that the iPhone has much better accessibility features than are available for Android so uh, they are getting better, though. I will say this, that I have some friends who use TalkBack, which is the screen reader on Android, and there are more apps. I think there were just more blind and visually impaired people using the iPhone, and they're starting now to do more with Android. So they are getting more apps available for blind and visually impaired on Android also. Good. Good. Sue, so thank you so much for spending the time with me today. And, and let's use this as an introduction to the topic. And we're going to follow up with some additional programs on this topic. So please send us your questions. Info at powerfulpatient.org. And we'll hope to see you on the next round. Okay. Thanks thank so you. much. Thank you.